following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Now, in this tradition, we study all the religions of the world. And that's because every religion, every mystical tradition, comes from the same root, which was the experience of its founder. Any genuine relig you know, religion or mystical tradition or, or type of spirituality is an attempt to convey something or communicate something of value and importance. So the main traditions that we study here, even though we call this tradition Gnosis, really we have four primary subjects or, or areas of study. And they're rooted in the most ancient religions, which are Hinduism, Judaism, many other religions as well. But these are the two main ones. And then the reform of those religions that came later, which are Buddhism and Christianity. So in the contemporary era, we know that there are people all over the world that study the religion that they grew up with or the religion that they became attracted to during their life. And all of those traditions are very beautiful and have a great deal of knowledge that they express to humanity. But unfortunately, people don't see religions for what they truly are. In the modern era, as a many recent centuries, religions have become a mere belief, something that people follow, respect, study, believe in, but rarely experience. It's very rare, sadly, to find anyone who has true experience of what their religion is teaching. In this tradition, the experience of the religion is our primary goal. Our primary interest is learning the practical value of each religion. And this is part of the reason why we study all of them. If we consider this for a second, we think about any type of knowledge, any type of information that we may want to acquire. Usually it's all based on something that someone has said, something that someone has affirmed. The question becomes, can we also confirm what has been said? Or do we merely accept it or reject it? Now, in the case of these four traditions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, and Christianity, all of them, in their essence, teach exactly the same thing. On the surface, they can appear different. In the terminology, they can appear different. In the colors and the shapes and the flavors and the, the, uh, the feeling of each tradition, it can seem different. But in their heart, they are exactly the same. They are attempting to convey an experience, something that cannot be communicated in words. Each one is like the expression of a person who's gone to another country and come back 
and said, I went here and I went there and I saw this place and I ate this food and I had all these great experiences and it was wonderful and the food tasted like this and they served this type of meal and I really enjoyed it and you should experience the same thing. And we hear all that and we get excited and we believe that that must be a great place to go, but we've never been there. And religions are exactly like that. We need to go to the place and experience it for ourselves in order to really know what that religion is about. So it'd be like us believing that India is a great country, but having never gone there. We may believe it, we may love it, we may talk about it, we may have lots of books about it and wear clothes from there and listen to music and burn incense and eat that food. But if we've never been there, we have no idea what the real experience is. Whereas someone who's been there knows. There's a big difference between these two. That difference is what we call gnosis. It is to have actual knowledge. That word gnosis means knowledge from experience. Now, all of these religions, these traditions that I'm pointing at, have tried to express the experience of what reality is. And they've all expressed it in their own words and using their own symbols and their own descriptions. But they're all describing the same thing, the nature of reality, what is real. Not in terms of a belief, not in terms of something that we should simply accept, but in terms of something that is experienceable, something that can be known. So these two illustrations represent symbolic ways of illustrating the experience that religion is pointing towards. This image on the left is an image of Kala Chakra. And it shows different dimensions, levels of existence through which beings experience. And the image on the right is the exact same thing, but from the Western world. It's called Kabbalah. It's called the tree of life. And that symbol shows the same thing. Many dimensions, many worlds through which beings have experience. In both of these cases, these symbols are an attempt to convey to us that our physical material existence is only a fraction of what exists. And sadly, most people, when they study these types of things, they either believe it or don't believe it and don't really understand that the purpose of these maps, these symbols, is to show us there is more. There's more to being alive and there's more to existence than just the material world. There's much more, but we don't perceive it. We need gnosis in order to understand that. And this word gnosis is a, is a Greek word. It means knowledge, but it doesn't mean knowledge in the way that we usually think of knowledge. We usually think of knowledge as something that we learn in a book or something that we study or are told. But really, gnosis refers to the kind of knowledge we gain from our experience, something that we have done and that we've proven and we know is real, we know is true. We know that in winter, it gets cold. We know that in summer, it gets hot. We know that if we eat certain kinds of food, it affects us in certain kinds of ways. Those are types of gnosis, shallow, but that is knowledge that we can confirm through our own perception. Now, everything that religion teaches us can also be known through our own perception if we know how to do it. And ultimately, all religions have attempted to teach us that. But nowadays, most people don't care. They simply want to believe something, to accept one and reject all the others. And this is really to the detriment of humanity. Now, the founders of these traditions that I've mentioned, none of them invented anything. None of them made anything up. Each one of them said in their own way that they were only teaching what was already known. 
the Buddha said, I have seen an ancient path and I'm teaching what the ancients taught. So he himself didn't invent anything new. Krishna said the same thing. Krishna said, whenever religion declines in the world, I come again to restore it. Same thing. It's that single ancient teaching that flourishes in many ways like flowers. Each flower has its own color, its own fragrance. But the beauty of that is the same. It's something living. That singular path is what we're really interested in. Not the beliefs, not the theories. We really don't care about beliefs because they don't change anything. Whatever we happen to believe makes no difference. And you'll observe that in your own life. If you really carefully watch your own beliefs, you'll find most of the time you find out that your beliefs were wrong. So you meet someone and you believe that they're this way and that way. And then as the years go, you find out that they're not the way you thought. And you discover new things and you find facts that contradict your beliefs. This is partly why many people leave religions. The religious leaders tell them reality is A, B, C. And you must believe this or you're going to hell. And then the followers find out that A, B, and C don't add up. They don't really make sense in terms of the facts of how nature works and how the mind works and how humanity works. So they leave the religion. Or they see the religious leader doing things that contradict what the religious leader has been saying all along. And they leave for that reason. Really, truthfully, if the religious leaders were teaching how to acquire gnosis, that problem wouldn't happen. This is why we emphasize it so heavily. As an instructor in this tradition, I really don't care what you believe. That's your business. I respect it. You can believe whatever you want. But my interest as an instructor is to help you come to know so that you don't have to believe. So you can know. You see, when you know something, there is no doubt. There's no fear. There's confidence. And not confidence in an outside group or an outside instructor or a teacher or a movement, but a confidence in yourself. And that has a lot of value. That gives you a strength that you really need in order to work successfully in any type of religious pursuit. That confidence comes from having knowledge that you yourself have acquired, where you have proven the cause and effect relationship between actions and their consequences. And this is simply what Gnosis is. That's all it is. From the most superficial level to the most profound level, Gnosis is that knowledge of cause and effect. It's empirical. Absolute. There's no room for belief in that. You may believe that this type of food will not hurt you, but you eat it and you get sick because the fact of cause and effect is simply a fact. Whatever you believe. The belief doesn't impact reality. Belief is a mental construction. This is why... Our great teacher, Samael M. Vior, stated that gnosis lives in facts. It withers away in abstraction. And it's difficult to find in the noblest of thoughts. Now, all of the students who come to religion and come to this type of teaching think a lot, have a lot of thoughts about gnosis or about their religion, about their spirituality, and have many abstract notions like beliefs. But the facts are where we find real knowledge. The only place we can find real knowledge. This is why we emphasize it so heavily. 
So let's start looking at facts. What are the facts of our spirituality? How do we get really practical with our spirituality? Obviously, we have to focus on ourselves. Spirituality is really about our relationship with everything else. It is about who we are, what we are, and what that means. So what are we? Who are we? This is where we start. We start looking at the facts, really taking things down to the simplest level. But somehow these simple things are very profound because we have a lot of beliefs about ourselves, thoughts about ourselves, and abstract concepts about ourselves, but we don't really know a lot of facts. And I don't mean facts like I was born in such and such a year and my name is this and that. And I'm from this country or that place, and I had these types of experiences. Those are not facts. Those are memories. And memories are subjective. They aren't real. By facts, I mean what is happening right now. What can you perceive and confirm is true? Now, this becomes a profound question because the first thing it requires is who is looking? Who is perceiving? Is it the body? Is it the eyes? Is it the ears? Is it the skin? Who is this? That's a very profound question, and really, it should be the origin of our religious pursuit, of our spiritual interest. Because that question is exactly where our suffering stems from, where our problems originate, <coughs> because we cannot answer it. We have beliefs, we have abstract ideas, we have theoretical knowledge. We have a lot of things that we've been told, but very little in terms of facts. And this is what we need to change. What are the facts of our perception? What can we perceive and confirm? So this, this originates a different way of approaching religion. Now, some traditions use this term to describe religious pursuit, they use the word self-realization. But really, that phrase <coughs> comes from Sanskrit. And the actual Sanskrit words are atmayana. Atma means self. Jnana means knowledge. But it's knowledge in the same way as gnosis. It is knowledge that is known through experience. So self-knowledge Self-realization. What is that? What is knowledge of self? Well, we begin here and now. Who is this self? Who am I? Who is this that's here? If we are willing to be superficial and say, well, my name is this and that, and I have this skin color, and I'm from this place, that all is very superficial but it doesn't lead to any understanding. That's not real knowledge. That's just appearances. So we need to go deeper and perceive and look and question what is past the mask? What is deeper than the superficial appearance? Where does the question itself originate? So it... Right at the start, we are doing a kind of introspection. Instead of looking outside and trying to say, what is God? What is Buddha? What is Dharma? We're looking inside. What am I? What is this perception? And why does it change? What is mind? What is emotion? 
These questions, when asked and watched and perceived, lead to real knowledge, real understanding. So we collect that type of inquiry when we talk about the term consciousness. Consciousness is the ability to perceive. Consciousness itself is not thought, not emotion, not sensation on the body. It is perception, but it is beyond the physical senses. Right now, we are all perceiving through the senses. We're hearing with our ears, seeing through our eyes. We can sense with the feeling of touch. Those perceptions are all being received in one place, and that is the consciousness itself. It is the perceiver that's looking through the, the mirror or the glasses of the senses. We can also call that awareness. And this is the central point that religion really rotates around because it is the center point of any experience of living, of existing. It is the state of consciousness that determines our experience of life. So what is our state of consciousness? What is our level? We probably don't really have an answer to that question, <laughs> but we should. The whole of our studies is about this. Everything is about this, the state of consciousness. So when we study this, we immediately need to analyze what is consciousness? How does it work? What do I experience of consciousness and perception? And if you're serious about that observation, you will discover that consciousness changes. Naturally, we know that our thoughts change and our emotions change. So we see them on this diagram of a person. We have lots of thoughts that happen, lots of emotions that happen, and we move the body. And we perceive all of that to some degree. But in the midst of it, our ability to perceive it changes. Sometimes we're not really aware. We're doing whatever we're doing and we have thoughts that are moving around in our heads and we have emotions that are moving around in our hearts, but we're not really aware of all of those things all of the time. We have a little bit of awareness of what we're doing when we're cooking, but really our awareness on the cooking is kind of, we paid a little attention, but mostly we're thinking. So while we're cooking, we're thinking, oh, I have this problem and I, I need to solve my problem and I need to figure out what I'm gonna do. So we're, our hands are doing the cooking, but our attention is distracted. Our attention is bouncing from this thought and this emotion. Then the phone rings and we take the phone call and then we're still cooking. And then someone's talking in the other room. And we're kind of listening to that conversation because we want to know what they're talking about. So the attention is not very strong. It leaps around. That is a state of consciousness. That quality which we can call a wild mind. Some call it monkey mind. It's, it's a very distracted state. And it's one in which suffering is the primary quality. A lack of knowing. The presence of uncertainty, anxiety, doubt, anger, envy, fear. Many emotional qualities and a surging mind with thoughts that constantly call for our attention and different sensations on the body that constantly call for our attention. In other words, a chaos, a random, constantly shifting, changing landscape with no certainty and nothing reliable. That is the state of consciousness of most people. And most people are not aware of it. But that is exactly what has to change if we want to understand what Gnosis is, what religion is.
It's that state. We need to understand what is perception? What is awareness? What are all of these things in myself? So really what we're talking about here is our psychology. And in this tradition, we talk about having three brains. Sounds funny. But really, it means three centers of activity, three psychological aspects. Our head, our heart, our hands, body, action, movement. Three realms of psychological functioning. Each one, unfortunately in us, tends to operate independent of the others without our awareness. So while we're thinking of something, some other feelings are happening in us, and physically we're doing something altogether different. So they're not integrated. And we're not really aware of all of them. This leads us to problems. It means that while we're distracted by thinking and distracted by emotions and doing different types of activities, we're not really aware of how all these relate to each other. And we're not really aware that each one of them is using energy in its own way. And we wonder why we're tired. And we wonder why we have pain and why we have doubt and anxiety and we have uncertainty. And we don't have answers to the questions that we need answered. And it's because of this, how our awareness, consciousness is engaged in all of this from moment to moment. So all the ancient religions present to the followers a way of changing that and working on that. And each one has their own term for that. Buddhism, they call it Dharma. Hinduism, they call it Yoga. Now these words have a great deal of significance. Today I want to talk about how Hinduism presents it. Because really, it's the oldest and it's also simple to understand and easy to apply. Now, most people, when they hear this word yoga, they think of stretching and contorting the body into all kinds of strange looking positions. That type of yoga is, is uh, really superficial. It's fine for exercising the body, but it has really nothing to do with awakening consciousness or developing spiritually. Yoga, as a Sanskrit word, means union. And it's describing the union of our experience with reality. It means that our individual perception becomes unified with facts, with what is real, what is true, not what is merely illusion, maya, but what is real. So that's really what yoga means. And from that perspective, you can see that doing different bodily positions isn't going to have much impact on your perception. It's only going to change the position of the physical body. We need to change the position of our perception. So that word's related to the Latin word religare, which means to reunite. And that's the root of the word religion. Now the chief teaching, the main and most important teaching of yoga is the Bhagavad Gita. And this is the central, one of the most important books in Hinduism. It's a teaching that Krishna gave. If you don't know who Krishna is, then you should read this book. Bhagavad Gita, it means the song of the Lord. And Krishna is an equivalent symbol to Jesus Christ from the West. In Buddhism, Avalokiteshvara, Chinrezi. These are all the same symbol. They represent the same thing. So this image here represents Krishna teaching a soul, a consciousness, about what he has to do. So yoga is the method through which we as a consciousness, as a perceiver, can unite our perception with facts with truth, with reality. So we can cut through the illusions, the obstacles, in order to understand something real, something true. And the way yoga approaches this 
is exactly the way that we just discussed through these three aspects. This is the beginning. So the first teaching that Krishna gives in the, in the Bhagavad Gita is how to act, how to use your skill, your energy, your body to act. And this is called karma yoga. And it's simply how to behave, how to work, how to be engaged in the world, how to take care of responsibilities, how to perform any action, even mentally or emotionally, not just with the hands, the body. And the second that he explains is called bhakti. And this is the path related with the heart. And the third is jnana, which is related with the intellect, the mind. Now these three, obviously we have them. And unfortunately, many people who study yoga take it superficially and literally, and they think that they should study only one of these. And this we find in every religion, not just in Hinduism. We find people who have an interest in spirituality and they only want to read and study their scripture. So they really are only interested in jnana yoga. They could be a Christian. They can be a Jew. They can be Islam, you know, a Muslim. They don't want to change the way they live their daily lives through how they act and engage with others. They don't really want to do anything emotional like pray. They're not interested in those things. They just like the idea. And likewise, we find people who just want to go to church or temple to have that devotional connection, to sing songs and to feel like they're getting something good from the priest or the Lama. And they need that emotionally, but they don't really want to study anything and they don't really want to change how they behave. And similarly, we find those who just want to do a lot of rituals. They do a lot of circumambulations or they do prostrations or they do whatever types of physical actions, but no emotional work and no intellectual study. The reality is these three are all the same. We need all three in order to be a balanced person. If you only exercise one arm, that arm will get very strong, but the rest of your body will be very weak and you'll look really weird. It's better if you exercise the whole body. And it's the same with our psyche, with our mind. When we exercise all the parts of ourselves, then we strengthen completely. And the same is true with yoga. So what we want to learn is how to integrate these. How to use them all simultaneously. And the chief way to do that is to be balanced in our daily practice, in our daily work, whatever spiritual approach we are adapting, adopting, utilizing, to try to make sure that every day we're using the body, we're using the heart, we're using the mind. But mostly we're using all of them with attention, awareness. And by doing that, we're working in the fourth path. In yoga and Hinduism, this is called Raja Yoga. This means the royal path, the royal yoga. And this Raja Yoga integrates everything and goes beyond any one of them. So really in our tradition, this is what we study. We're studying a more complete system. We're not just studying with the mind. We're not just doing devotional practice. We're not just moving the physical body. We're using all of them integrating them, using them together. Now, this approach is the same in every religion, but with different words. When you study Raja Yoga, the main text or tenet of Raja Yoga is in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And it's called Ashtanga, which means eight-limbed, or having eight aspects, which is the same as Buddhism, has the eightfold path. Two different ways of saying the exact same thing. So I want to give you a little outline of these eight steps, and then we'll talk in more specifically about the first couple. The very basis and beginning of any 
approach to spirituality. It's yama. It's a Sanskrit word. Now, this word yama has a lot of significance. Those of you who studied the course called Baba Chakra, about the wheel of becoming, know that yama is also the name of the god of the dead. And that name has a lot of meaning. It's a very deep and powerful word. In the context of yoga, it means restraint, forbearance, control. Really, the best way to translate this to English is ethics. To be ethical. So in every religion you have, every time, every, anyone that ever approaches any religion, the first thing they have to learn is don't smoke, don't drink, don't sleep around, don't do stupid things, don't steal, don't kill. All these types of behaviors. You have to learn things that you shouldn't be doing. And many people think, why are they telling me what to do? There's a reason. Cause and effect. Action and consequence. Behaviors produce consequences. When you act this way, you get this result. No exceptions. When you're kind, when you smile, others smile. They can't help it. It's action and consequence. When you frown, when you're angry, you affect others. When you have a bad mood, you come into a place storming around, you affect everyone. Action and consequence. Facts. Now you notice just this simple example that we don't have any notice of that. None. Because we still storm around angry. We gossip about others. We talk badly about others. We do things that we shouldn't do that we know supposedly that we shouldn't do, but we still do it. It shows that we don't have gnosis of that. We don't really understand how our behaviors produce consequences, not only for us, but for other people. So this first step, yama, is important. The second one is niyama. And this means observances, precepts, These are things that uh, we should be doing. So the first one is things that you really shouldn't be doing. And the second one is things you should be doing. And the third is asana. It refers to our use of the physical body. Now, this word literally means posture. And most people think that asana means hatha yoga postures. That you have to sit in padmasana or you have to learn the lotus position in order to advance spiritually, which is not true. But really, this word is here because it means we need to be relaxed. Relaxation. Believe it or not, that is a spiritual prerequisite. A body and a mind that's tense is a body and mind that is resisting, that is in conflict that is suffering. So to relax is to let that tension go, to not be engaged in a conflict, to be open. And there's a great deal of significance in that. Most students who enter any type of spirituality skip all three of these because most students think, oh, well, these are so easy. I want to get to the good stuff. So they skip on down to the next levels where they, they find more interesting things like pranayama, pratyahara. And they want to start doing these spiritual practices and they just don't even want to think about the ethics. But there's a reason why Patanjali taught these steps in this order. And it's because every other religious founder also taught these steps in this order because they fit together according to cause and effect. You cannot be successful in pranayama and pratyahara if you skip the first three steps. It won't happen. Pranayama, commonly interpreted as breath control or breathing exercises, is really much more powerful than that. Breathing really has very little to do with it. Pranayama is about controlling energy. 
Prana is life force, the vital energy. It's the root energy of being alive. When you learn pranayama, you're learning to control that energy and utilize it. You can't if you're tense, if you've been doing things you shouldn't be doing. It won't happen. Pranayama will be ineffective. Same with pratyahara, which is deeper. Pratyahara is when you are withdrawing attention from the senses, physical senses. It's preparation for meditation, but it has more usefulness than simply that. Pratyahara is a state of consciousness in which you're withdrawing from the physical world in order to turn inward to work in your spiritual practice. You really need pratyahara just to pray. Simple prayer. But you'll notice that when you've done something harmful or you're in a bad state emotionally or mentally, it's very difficult to pray well because the emotion's surging. But when you're very peaceful, when you haven't done anything wrong, when you feel calm and relaxed, prayer is completely different. There's a completely different impact. And that's because of how these work together. They're based upon one another, they're levels. When one learns to withdraw attention from the senses, one can then enter into real concentration, which is called dharana. And concentration, what we mean here is the ability to place attention on something and not be distracted. And the reason this is important is because in our current state, we don't have that. Our attention is easily distracted. We try to concentrate on something, but there's so many thoughts, so many emotions, worries, fears, so much anxiety, so many things to think about and things we want to do and TV shows we want to watch that really we don't get very far with any one activity. Concentration is necessary in order for us to reach the higher states. Dhyana is actual meditation. This is a state in which we have suspended the senses, withdrawn the attention inward and focused on something specific, and then totally become concentrated and absorbed in that concentration. From that emerges this final state, which is called samadhi. And this is where we experience reality. Now, this can sound a little overwhelming. And what's the point? The point is, it's here in samadhi where you experience who you truly are. What you really are because you have set your, your body and your mind in a state of peace and you have drawn perception from all of that so that that perceiver can perceive itself and experience itself. And that is where we discover what we really are, our true nature. In Buddhism, this is called Tathagatakarva, Buddha nature. It is the true identity, the true nature of the mind, the true nature of perception. In that experience, there is no suffering. There is no anxiety. There's no pain, no doubt. There is a profound peace. And that peace is accompanied by joy and an all embracing love. That's why every founder of every religion has said these things, that the religion is about kindness. It's about love, compassion, generosity, all of those virtues, the paramitas, those are expressions of our true nature. It isn't outside of us. You cannot find it in a temple or a book. You can't find it in a teacher. You can find it inside. 
It's here, right now, in you. But you can't perceive it because of the clouds of the mind. But learning those simple steps, basically learning how to meditate properly, you learn to withdraw attention from everything, pull it inside, and perceive yourself for being what you truly are. And in that perception, you see that that inner reality is more real than what you are seeing here physically. Hard to understand that with the intellect, but it's a truth. This is a fact that any one of you can confirm. It's a type of gnosis. If you really study yourself and study meditation, you will experience it. You will confirm it. But you can't skip any step. You can't say, I'm going to go have that. I'm going to go to Samadhi right now. I'm going to skip all this other stuff because it doesn't, it's com confusing, complicated. I'm going to go straight there. Good luck. It doesn't work like that. Every tradition has their own way of presenting these steps. I'm just losing this model from Patanjali because it's simple. Even if you don't think it's simple, it actually is very simple. And anyone can do it. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what your religious background is. It makes no difference. It has nothing to do with beliefs. This has to do with learning to use consciousness in the right way. With awareness. Now, this state, samadhi, we're talking about it now in the context of meditation because that's where we will probably have our first experience of it. But it is not restricted to meditation. It is simply a state of perception. And it's likely that many people have already experienced it, but didn't know the name. To put it in another way of understanding what samadhi is, samadhi is an experience of perceiving the reality without any filter. Meaning that the mind is not changing what you perceive. There's no anger present. There's no doubt, no fear, no lust, no envy, no jealousy. Pure perception, unclouded, unfiltered. And it may only last briefly. And this type of perception can happen to us easily when we're children, when we're very young, because our karmic debt hasn't fully trapped us yet. So as a child, you may remember th seeing things and having a kind of experience that you can't explain easily, but it moved you very deeply. And it may be something simple, even that appears to be meaningless, but it can be related to a type of samadhi, a type of perception that was very pure and had a feeling of happiness and joy and just peacefulness. It's something that we know is real because most of us have experienced it in some form. It can be our normal state because it is the natural state of the consciousness. The state that we have now is unnatural, abnormal. The quality of consciousness that we have, the quality of mind that we have, we made it. We suffer because we don't perceive the truth of ourselves. We're in pain and in doubt and in darkness, ignorant, because we don't perceive the reality. We are confused by our thoughts, by our feelings, and by impulses in the body. And we don't see them for what they are. But when we learn how to use perception and learn how to use our energy, harnessing our energy, we can cut through those veils. If you know the symbol of Manjushri with the sword, that sword represents that ability to cut through appearances, to cut through everything in order to see what's real. And that reality is in us, all, always. But it takes courage. 
takes energy. So the way we do that, we have to apply from the step one, yama, restraint. There are five aspects to yama in the system of yoga, and these five are present in every religion as well. Number one is ahimsa. Most people think ahimsa just means nonviolence. So you go on a protest and you don't beat anybody up. That's not all ahimsa is. If you really want to look at ahimsa in a realistic way as for what it really is, it's compassion. It's love. It's the same as the paramitas. The first paramita is generosity. This is the same. It is to have the right attitude. Now, it's called restraint because to do this, we have to restrain our self-love, our selfishness, the ego. And by restraining it, having awareness of it, we can then allow our true nature to begin to express itself, which is altruism, generosity, to be kind. The second is satyam, truthfulness. It means that we need to be honest, truthful, not only with other people, but with ourselves. Asteya is to not steal. Brahmacharya is to have sexual purity, chastity. And aparigraha is renunciation, freedom from desires. These are difficult, especially in the modern era, because we are constantly being assailed with encouragement to do the opposite of all these. Every TV show is about himsa, cruelty, violence, not merely physical violence, but mental violence and emotional violence. Sarcasm and jokes are a type of violence most of the time where we're making fun of others, belittling others, being cruel. Satyam, most of the media, the television, the magazines and newspapers, none of it is true. There's a great deal of false information, a lot of lying. And more and more people make their living being paid to lie. And we should not fall into that. Asteya, to not steal. <laughs> the modern world, everyone's stealing from everyone else, trying to get whatever they can for nothing. Brahmacharya, obviously this world has no interest in sexual purity. This is a sad truth. Most people are only interested in lust, pursuing desires in that form, not realizing that it's completely opposite of any real spiritual work. And aparigraha, renunciation. This is a big one in this world. Everybody wants to have their spiritual life and get all their material pleasures too. Really, the material aspect of things is irrelevant. What's important here is an attitude of renunciation. To not be always focused on getting things. And it doesn't mean just material things. It means circumstances too. And we're always obsessed with the idea that I've got to get this situation. I need to get into this other place to live, or I need to get married, or I need to get some concept that I have, some belief that if I have that, I'll be happy. We need to learn instead to not afflict ourselves with so many desires, but to be more simple. So the accompanying aspect is niyama, which is precepts. Saucha is to have purity. And this is not only physically, but psychologically. To learn to be pure, to be clean. This is a main, this is a really big one. It's the first of these precepts. And some people think, oh, it just means keep your clothes clean and take a shower. And this is part of it, to be clean people. 
but to be psychologically clean. That isn't easy, especially nowadays. Because we're exposed to a lot of dirtiness, filthy things on TV, the movies, amongst friends. The topics of conversation and the things that people are interested in are often really dirty. Not good, not healthy. This also implies to be, to have integrity, to be pure hearted, to not have guile or cunning, not trying to cheat people, but to be honest. Santosha is to have contentment, to be happy with what you have, to see what you have and be grateful. Not only material things, but also the people in your life, the circumstances of your life, even when they're difficult. Tapas, austerity or penance. Now, traditionally, tapas is looked at as as uh, behaviors that you adopt in order to pay karma. So people will go on a pilgrimage, they'll, they'll go, they'll do uh, prostrations all the way to the temple and all the way back home. And that's a kind of tapas or austerity. And there's value in those approaches to spirituality. But in this tradition, we look at these, all of these in a deeper way. When you take, when you take this type of path, you're really adopting it and you're putting it into work in your life on a daily basis, the tapas is going to come. You don't need to create it. You don't need to go making difficulties for yourself because you will get them. It's part of the work. Part of the spiritual path is that your own true nature is going to reveal to you the things that you need to change. And those are revealed to you through difficulties. We call them ordeals, trials, challenges, difficulties. One of the chief skills that a student needs to learn is to perceive all circumstances as tapas, austerities, penance. So that when you get a problem, you don't immediately react with, oh, not again. Why me? Woe is me. And then we go to all our friends and say, can you believe this is happening? This guy, he did this and he did that. And we complain. But really the right attitude is to take that problem and say, thank you. Because this problem is revealing to me my weakness, my shortcoming. Now I can change it. This is my chance to change it. This is my chance to not behave in a poor way, but to reach another level. And so we take all things as tapas. The next one is Svadaya which is the study of our scriptures. Now on this note, I want to point out that Svadaya has a lot to do with Jnana Yoga, which is the cultivation of the mind, where we start training ourselves about the tradition that we're studying, about religion, studying the scriptures and studying the teachings. It's not about memorization. It's about comprehension, to really understand what is being taught and make it practical. I'm putting it that way because many people read this precept and they think it means that they need to have this whole scripture memorized and that they can repeat it word for word. This is fine. But it doesn't mean that if they keep behaving the same way they were behaving before. What it really means is to understand it and to be able to act on it, especially without having to think about it. When you really comprehend a scripture, you know it in your heart. It isn't intellectual. Comprehension is here in the heart. And the last of the precepts is Ishvara Pranidana. Usually this is translated as uh, surrendering to God, but here we call it self-remembering. And it's important because Ishvara is a reference to the innermost, to the divinity that is inside. Pranidana is to remember or perceive, to pay attention to. Whatever our approach, whatever our decision, whatever we do with ourselves, 
from moment to moment and day to day. If we can make these 10 things guidelines for our behavior, we will be spiritual. Whether we believe in spirituality or not, whether we believe in a religion or not, but if we can adopt this type of ethical way of perceiving, we start to change. Not only changing our lives, but changing what we see and what we experience. So this is how someone starts to really understand what is gnosis and what is religion. All of it is summarized in observing yourself. All of it. To be mindful, to be aware. That is the beginning of meditation. That is the beginning of samadhi. So all of the steps that we went over of Raja Yoga are simply that. We broke it into a lot of pieces to analyze it in detail, but really the synthesis of it is to observe yourself all the time. Now that observation should not be one of judgment. It should be one that's impartial, where you're looking at yourself as though you don't know yourself. This is a different attitude. We usually don't really look at ourselves. We're usually looking out and comparing what's out there with what we want or don't want. And that's why we suffer. That's why we're tense. That's why we're stressed. Stress and tension are a disagreement between reality and a desire. If you throw the desire out and you see the reality, it's nothing to be tense about. When we look at the facts, there's nothing to be tense about. If you have a problem, you look at the problem. If it has a solution, you can solve it. If it doesn't have a solution, you can't solve it. Either way, no reason to be upset. We all know that. The Dalai Lama told us that. Simple. But we don't know it because we get tense. So all of these steps need to become practical for us. Something that we work with on a daily basis. The study of scripture is important. The study of the doctrine is important. To understand the terminology is important. To know about the structures of the mysticism and how all the pieces fit together, this is all important. But it all means nothing if we're not really actively working with changing our perception. And that begins with how we perceive ourselves. So any questions? Yeah, the health of the body is really important. Uh, th throughout the whole body, we have a lot of physical issues and energetic problems, uh, many of which are caused by environmental problems like toxins and impurities, chemicals. So the first thing is to try to eat and drink the purest food and water that you can. That itself does a lot to clean the glands. Clean water, drinking a lot of clean water. Don't drink sodas and don't drink all those things that you can buy in jars and bottles at the store. Drink water. That does a lot to clean the body on every level. And secondly is when you start working with these energetic practices like pranayama, those exercises stimulate and cleanse the channels of energy uh, throughout the body. They're called nadis, particularly around those glands, the pineal gland being, of course, a main one. And that gland, of course, is atrophied in all of us, but we need it to be strengthened and awakened so that we can develop our capacities. And that daily circulation of energy cleans and restores that gland as well. Now, that energy is more powerful than fluoride. There is some scientific evidence that shows that fluoride has a negative impact on the endocrine system. 
So personally, I try to avoid it. But there are places where you can't. They put it in everything. So you can do your best. Try not to ingest that as, you know, as much as you can avoid it. But I wouldn't stress over it. The main thing is understand that an inferior substance is always overcome by a superior one. So even if you're eating food that's not that good, which is the case for everybody on this planet right now, if we're really engaged in our spiritual work and transforming energy, we're getting superior forms of energy through that. And so that will nourish us and sustain us. Another question? Okay. Um, is that I do is um, meditate in the shower with an ice hot shower and then turn the water onto freezing cold without trying to, without lose the flow of my breath. Because the first instinct is to, is to kind of gasp. Is, is that worthwhile? Or is that just like, pushing something kind of craziness over the edge. And, and these are just things that I've heard from other people. So, you know, I, I just wanted to get um, your take. Yeah, there are varieties of pranayamas that utilize the changing of temperature. Uh, but they don't really have much application in the approach that we take here. Okay. What we're trying to do here is to <laughs> relax the body and stimulate the consciousness so that we focus all of our attention internally. So we don't want to stimulate the body or shock the body. We want the body to be fully relaxed and basically let the body sleep while the consciousness becomes active internally. Uh, that brings me to a third question. Um, meditation in a, sep in a sensory deprivation tank. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the second. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with them. Sure. Yeah, the same issue. You know, when, when you learn how to relax properly, you don't need a sensory deprivation tank. It's unnecessary. Learning to relax, learning to work with energy in the body, you automatically learn to extract attention from the senses. The body rests at, on its own, perfectly at ease, without the difficulty or expense of one of those tanks. And the benefit of that is that you can then meditate anywhere, anytime. So, you know, the tank's fine. Those are interesting, but they're not necessary. And in fact, they can become a crutch. You could become dependent on it. Um, my, ne my next question is about DMT. Is that something that is beneficial? And are, are the experiences of reality? What we're trying to do in this tradition, like like most or many traditions, is strengthen the consciousness so that it can perceive reality without any filters, without any external conditioning. So as we are now, our consciousness is conditioned. It's conditioned by the state of being that we have created. And that is our misperception of reality and our misperception of ourselves. By injecting substances into the body, that afflict the consciousness, we only condition it further. You don't perceive reality in that way. To perceive reality, you have to remove all conditioning. And that's why we meditate. We extract the consciousness from the body, which is a type of conditioning. We extract it from physical sight, from hearing, from smell, from touch, from taste. We extract it from anger and pride and envy and greed and gluttony and all forms of desire. And in that we reach what we call samadhi. It's a state in which we perceive without any condition. And that's how we experience our true nature. And there are many kinds of perceptions that you can have. They may be pleasant or unpleasant. It doesn't make them real. You know, there's any, there's uncountable numbers of ways of modifying and conditioning consciousness. And all the people who follow all those ways say that they are seeing reality and say they're getting blissful experiences, et cetera, et cetera. But the proof is in the facts of things. 
we want to experience the reality without any dependency on anything other than our true nature. So in this tradition, we don't rely on any external uh, influence like chemicals, drugs, plants, machines, you know, those CDs that are supposed to produce certain types of brain waves or music that you're supposed to listen to or some teacher that's supposed to sit nearby you and do certain mantras or whatever, any of that stuff. And the reason is self-realization, self-knowledge, liberation are only inside of us. We don't need anything outside. The truth is inside. Liberation is inside. Freedom is inside. So we're, we're very much a, a purist approach in that way. Any other question? I don't know how true is that. Like one of my friends told me when you do a basic meditation, you have to count the breathing. So if you inhale and exhale, that's the one of the basic meditation. I don't know how true is that. You yeah, know. counting the breath is a preliminary exercise. Not the type of meditation though. Well, you, you can, some people will call it meditation in the same way that you can call uh, doing a warm up before a workout as part of the workout. Yeah. Counting the breath or anapana or doing pranayamas, all these exercises are preliminary. They're warm-ups. Some people never go past the warm-up, which is fine because we're all at, a, at our own level and we need, to, we need to work with that level. But meditation properly spoken, properly defined is a state of perception. It isn't a practice. And it, it, when I outlined those steps for you, Meditation begins with dharana and dhyana. It's where the consciousness begins to focus entirely inside on whatever it's concentrating on, where the external perception is receding. We're not distracted by the senses. The consciousness expands. Now, this is an important point because our consciousness, the way it is now, is very heavily conditioned and weak. So now when we try to place attention on something, it really takes a lot of interest in that thing for us to pay attention to it. We have concentration. But generally, we're not really that interested in whatever we're doing. Unless we're like watching some soap opera and it's at the climax of the, the story and we really want to know what's going to happen, we can be very concentrated on that show. So that degree of concentration is what we need when we meditate. And you'll notice in that experience that you can also be so concentrated on something that you don't even hear people. And someone can be saying, hey, I asked you three times. You're not listening to me. You say, oh, I'm sorry. I was paying attention to this thing. I was listening you know, to the, to the phone conversation or whatever. So we do have the ability to concentrate very well. When that deepens and we isolate those disturbing influences and we're no longer distracted by them, that concentration goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it reaches a certain threshold beyond which we enter something new, a whole other type of perception where we're no longer feeling like I'm that person who has that physical body and that appearance. We are something else. This is where we experience the true nature. That is real meditation. It's that perception. So and we use the term meditation in a loose way, I think, in most traditions. Like if you sit a certain way and you breathe a certain way, you're meditating. Not really. <laughs> Not really. You may have the appearance of meditating, but to really be meditating doesn't matter about your, your physical posture. A master can be meditating while they're walking down the street, having a conversation, but their attention their perception is in a state of, of meditation. It's very different from us, but it's someone who's developed that skill. Okay, you're saying like belief doesn't affect uh, our reality, right? But then if somebody has a belief, like the ego is like, can be a belief. Like if you have an ego that says like, I'm a bad person, or like I believe that like, I can never do this, or I believe that this is impossible. Isn't that actually affecting the reality? Like they're not going to be able to do that thing because that's, that's their belief. The belief influences it, 
but what changes it is how they act. So if you, if you listen to that belief, that thought that says, I'm hopeless, there's, I'm no good, I can't do it, but then you act on it, that does change things. It's the action that changes it. There's a distinction. The belief is one thing. The action's another. It's the same distinction that we make between having good intentions and how you actually behave. We may have really good intentions, but if our action produces suffering, we accrue the consequence of that. There's no exception. You may have meant to do something good, but if you, if you do something harmful, <laughs> it's the action that makes the difference. So beliefs are just like vapor, smoke. Someone can believe in Satan and call themselves a Satan worshiper, a black magician, a devil. But if they are going around feeding the hungry and doing charitable works, they will receive benefit. You see the difference? It's like yeah. the belief is irrelevant. It's the action that counts. I just had a random thought. Like why, why is it that Christianity and Judaism somehow came to be like, like people, everyone perceives those religions as if God is something outside of them. How did that come about if religion is all about just knowing your, your own nature? Yeah, that happens in every tradition, actually, even in Buddhism and Hinduism. So Buddha Shakyamuni came to reform Hinduism. He didn't come to, to throw it out or to disagree with it. Part of the reason that he, well, one of the things that he taught was that the Hindus had fallen into idol worship, assuming that all the gods were outside of them and different from them. And what he was pointing out was everything that you need for liberation is inside of you. This is what Jesus taught too, same thing. So it happens in every tradition, even in the Gnostic tradition, it's happening where people are making of the tradition, something to be worshiped and believed in, and they don't actually live it and act upon it. They don't engage in the practical aspect on a daily basis. And that's part of the reason I wanted to give this lecture. It's really important that the instructors emphasize this all the time. Believing in this tradition is completely meaningless. It doesn't benefit anyone. It's when one acts upon it, you know, lives it, that it has value. I think what happened was in the West that the, the practical application of the teachings uh, was set aside because of the interest in power. The ones who were, who were responsible for guiding humanity were fighting to retain power. And the way they did that was taking the power away from the individual and, and telling the individual, you're powerless and you can only advance with our help. And that's wrong. Okay. If, we, if we can remember some of the experiences that we had as an infant, you said we have maybe that state of consciousness. Yeah. Are you doing some meditate on those experiences? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. We should meditate on all of our experiences, especially those that we can remember where we experience real joy, freedom, peace, because those experiences have causes and conditions. They, they arise because of cause and effect. So by meditating on those things, we can understand that cause and effect and learn to apply it, you know, put those forces into motion in our lives now. It's definitely of value. Consciously, but we usually don't. Uh, but anyways, so I'm wondering. 
Yeah, I understand your question. Well, this, these eight stages don't represent everything that can happen. These are just the stages that you need if you want to reach Samadhi. Okay. Anywhere along this way, it's possible to leave the body if the circumstances allow it. So even if you get relaxed, you, you've done your ethical work and you get relaxed, you can go right out of your body right there. You can be doing pranayama and go out of your body. You can be doing pratyahara and go out of your body. You follow? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes, you know, I agree. Yeah. So samadhi, however, is, can only be reached through this process. Now, the thing is, the samadhi can happen so quickly that you don't even realize that these other ones happened. When you get very relaxed and concentrated, you can go right through all of them in an instant. And then go right back to the beginning in an instant, because these aren't, you know, slow laboring stages where you have to make a lot of effort through each part. It's, it doesn't work like that. These are, these are qualities of consciousness, in other words. Now, to be out of the body in some sense is somewhat irrelevant to the conversation because samadhi being a state of consciousness, it can happen in any dimension. You can have a samadhi while you're still in your body. As I was explaining during the lecture, a master, for example, can be having a conversation with you and be in a state of samadhi. This is not an unusual thing. It's simply a state of perception that's unfiltered. Likewise, you can, from any of these states, you can go out of your body and experience being out of the body and you can have samadhi there or not. Because again, it's just a state of consciousness. Not at all. Nope. We, every time you dream, you're out of your body. Right? And d the dreaming state has many qualities, many levels of consciousness there, from the very inferior levels to very superior levels. But that doesn't equate samadhi. That's right, because you can be out of your body, but still the consciousness is filtered. Yeah, that would be my advice. The thing is, the body is a type of conditioning. And it's like you see on the tree of life, the physical body is quite low. So if you have the ability or, or have the experience where you can get out of that body, do it. Because in the more subtle level, you've removed a whole set of veils, a whole set of conditioning, uh, conditioned circumstances. And you're getting closer and closer to a pure experience. Does that make sense? So that's, you know, in, there are practices in Tantra where you learn to extract perception from all of the veils or sheaths or koshas, if you want to call them that, bodies, until you are left with the consciousness in its pure state without any sheath, without any filter. And this is common in all forms of Tantra. And that's the, ultimately, that's what we need to reach to, to really perceive without any filter, to see the reality. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing available from booksellers worldwide. 
You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.